Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Skywatcher What's Up webcast. Uh, this is something that we do every Friday right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Uh, if you've never joined us before, happy Friday. Welcome and thank you for being here. And of course, if you've joined us before, welcome back and happy Friday. And thanks for being with us. Um, the Skywatcher What's Up webcast takes place every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Uh, we cover everything from what's up into the nighttime sky, to equipment, to helpful tips and tricks for your observing and imaging. And then, of course, the last episode of the month, we talk about, uh, or we have a special guest on to talk about their experiences in astronomy and their specialties. Um, so that's generally how our schedule works around here. And um, most of the time, these episodes are live. Um, unfortunately, I am out of town this week, so I'm not able to be here with you guys. But we don't like skipping um, a week, so we try to make sure there is a new episode every single week, even if that means pre-recording one. And that's what we're doing today. But hopefully you guys are watching this live um, right at 10 a.m. Pacific. That's when all of our uh, episodes actually occur live. And every week is a different topic. So, you know, if there's something you want to go back and learn about, or maybe you missed something, or you want to share it with somebody, um, all of our episodes for the What's Up webcast are, are recorded um, and saved onto our YouTube channel. So you can just go on and... Uh, check those out anytime uh, when it's convenient for you. And of course, if there's ever something that you want us to do an episode on or you have some comments or whatever, um, go ahead and email us at support at skywatcherusa.com, title it What's Up, and then that way we know it's about the What's Up webcast and we can answer that for you. Um, if you like what we do here and you want to keep up with what's going on, go ahead and hit subscribe um, on the channel. It really does help us out um, as things get bigger. And then it'll actually keep you up to date as we release new episodes. Uh, we are getting ready to release the uh, next set of uh, scheduling um, for the fall uh, part of the year. So keep an eye on that. Uh, that'll be coming up here shortly. Now... This episode um, is all about lunar eclipses, which I gather you probably figured out from the title um, of all of this. But we have a lunar eclipse coming up um, next week. This is May 26, 2021. Um, we're not solely going to focus on that eclipse on its own. Um, it just happens to be what's coming up at, as the recording of this. But... Um, I wanted this to basically be an episode where we're not just focusing on one particular um, lunar eclipse, but, you know, all lunar eclipses. So hopefully what you can, or what you do learn from here, or if this is just review for you, thanks for being here anyway. Um, but hopefully this will be helpful if you are trying to learn about how a lunar eclipse works and uh, ultimately capture those images and how to observe uh, these celestial events. So that's what this episode's about, is lunar eclipses. Um, this is getting prepped for the May 26, 2021 eclipse, but um, of course there'll be many eclipses to come, and we'll talk about how to locate and find if, how eclipse is going to be visible in your area, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's get started with all of that. So first off, before we actually, I know this is titled... Uh, how to photograph a lunar eclipse, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about. But before you photograph anything, you should probably understand what we're actually looking at doing. Um, and it's important that you understand different types of eclipses because it's going to probably dictate what kind of equipment you're going to use and, you know, how you go about it, or even if you think it's worth getting up and uh, observing um, such an event. Now, a lunar eclipse is really quite basic. I'm sure many of you who are watching this know what it is, but if not, that's no problem. A uh, lunar eclipse is when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow. And generally the order of this is you have the sun, the Earth, and of course our moon. And yes, I know for all of our um, perfectionists that are watching this, I understand this is not to scale. It's really not a big deal. This is just to get the... Um, idea around so yes i understand it's not to scale the earth is not that big to the sun it's much smaller 
and so is the moon and everything's further away but i only have so much room on a, a monitor so how do these things work well as with anything we have light coming from the sun and as light goes towards earth just like anything else if you were to stand outside it's going to cast a shadow now earth always has a shadow that it's casting out into space and at certain times our moon depending on its orbital period and where it lands will pass within that shadow but most of the time you're not actually seeing the shadow out in space but every once in a while it just lines up to where the moon does pass into it and that's what a lunar eclipse actually is now there are two parts to the shadow of earth there's the outer shadow which is known as the penumbra um, this is usually outside the the more defined portion of the the shadow but this is the outer not as dark area um, known as the penumbra and then of course the shadow itself is the umbra the actual dark part of that shadow and at times the moon can pass in these different regions and it varies on what type of eclipse we're actually going to be observing or what type of lunar eclipse we're actually going to be looking at so um, it's important to know these different structures within the, the shadow so we know what type of eclipse it is how dark the moon's going to be because um, some eclipses it's just you won't notice much and other eclipses eclipses are very dramatic so knowing the different types of uh, structures inside of the Earth's shadow is important to justify which kind of eclipse we're actually talking about. So this is just kind of a diagram if we were to actually make it more of a circular like it is uh, naturally. So we have the penumbra on the outside, which is the outer shadow. And then of course we have the umbra, which is the, the darker shadow. Now, when it comes to lunar eclipses, there's actually two types. Um, there's partial eclipse, and of course, then there's total, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make myself disappear here for a second because it's going to get in the way of my diagram that I worked so hard on uh, for you guys to see. So, again, um, the red par or portion is the umbra, and the white portion is the penumbra, which is the outer shadow. Now, on a partial eclipse we have our moon and throughout the event the moon will slowly drift through uh, the penumbra or the outer portion of earth's shadow and it will get a little bit dark you know here's an example of that uh, it depends on how deep into the shadow it's going to get but this is a partial eclipse and i think you can kind of figure out a partial eclipse just means it's never fully covered up but doesn't really make it into the umbra or the the main part of the shadow it just kind of grazes within uh, within the uh, penumbra there sometimes it goes pretty deep and covers up the majority of the moon where other times it's sometimes it's not even noticeable so it just kind of depends on what you're looking to do or, or just how things kind of work out for that area um, some uh, partial eclipses can be like I said deep where it's covering a lot of the moon and then other ones it, it could be hardly noticeable because it just grazes the inside of the uh, penumbra and then of course as things continue it moves out of the the area and goes back to just being a full moon now the more dramatic eclipse is of course the total eclipse and a total eclipse is where the moon will actually pass of course it goes into the umbra or i'm sorry the penumbra and then it moves into the actual umbra and many of you might have seen pictures of the moon where it turns into like this copper or reddish tone and that coloration comes from being in the penumbra or the umbra itself um, you can actually look up why the colors uh are that way but this is what happens during a uh, total lunar eclipse as the moon goes through earth's shadow or the umbra as it's called and it will pass through and eventually coming out the other side back into the penumbra and then of course moving out of the way completely into back into the full moon and of course as you should know uh, lunar eclipses only happen during a full moon they're not going to happen when it's in some kind of partial phase 
So just an FYI. So from there, that's basically the two types of eclipses. Now it comes up quite a bit. Um, when am, when is it? When is the next eclipse going to be? And you know that's that's always a major question. And the hard part about it is just because an eclipse is occurring doesn't mean you are going to see it. It's not visible everywhere in the world. So you have to be in the right place at the right time in order to see an eclipse. That's true for lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. It's just about being at the right place. So the first thing is, like I said earlier, eclipses are not visible everywhere. Um, obviously one side of the earth is going to be daytime the other side is going to be nighttime you know it's not always going to be visible where you are and knowing where it's going to be visible is important so you can know if you're going to see it or not and if you are going to see it you know what are we actually talking about seeing um, and i'm going to show you a couple websites i like to use to find out that information so Probably the best way to do that, of course, is online. Uh, you can do it with apps like Sky Safari and Stellarium. Um, I use those apps quite a bit. Once I know there's an eclipse coming, if I want to figure out like fields of view or when it's going to be visible in my location as far as time, um, I like to use those apps. But if uh, you want to know what it's going to be in your region, just do a quick Google search. I'm going to bring that up real quick. So. Uh, this is timeanddate.com. Uh, you can usually just look up eclipses and it will come up. Um, Time and Date is a really cool website and they do a very nice job at basically explaining what's going to happen as far as an eclipse goes. Um, what I like is they actually have these animations that they do a very good job on and they're going to show you like exactly when things start. They're going to show you the magnitude, which is important if you're going to be uh, shooting it. Uh, photographically it's gonna give you the the start points of when everything's gonna occur so there's a there's a lot of cool stuff on this website and again this is timeanddate.com um, again this is just the anim animation here it's gonna show you in UTC time what this is gonna look like and how dramatic it's gonna look so um, of course what we're looking at here is the March or I'm sorry the May 26 2021 eclipse um, so just an FYI, if you're watching this in the future and this is past, you can, uh, actually go ahead and check that out. But this is something that they do for every eclipse. So it's a really great website to actually use. So timeanddate.com. Now, another thing that they do is they have diagrams of the actual path that, or not the path, the visible areas. So this is obviously the earth. And everything in red is gonna get the total eclipse. And you can actually click on your location. There you go. So we'll just pick Hawaii because it just happens to be getting the whole thing during this eclipse. It'll give you all the time for that particular area. So, you know, if wherever you live in the world, you know, you could put in your address or whatever, um, you know, let's say we're in Los Angeles, we'll click there. It's gonna give you all the times of when this is gonna start and when it's gonna end and when all the phases are gonna be. This is a very good website to use um, for your area. Now, everything in red or that shaded color uh, shading there is going to get some form of the eclipse. Now you can kind of press on different regions and it's gonna tell you and show you how much you're gonna get um, on this particular one, if you're on the East Coast, you're not going to get much. And as you move out to the West, you'll get the, the whole thing. Um, and of course, that's the same uh, way is true if you move out to the uh, Asia continents and Australia and the Pacific and stuff like that. Um, so this one just happens to be going through there. Now, everything that's kind of normal, you know, white and blue, that's daytime. You're not going to be able to see it. So that's generally how this chart uh, works. So it's kind of a cool website. You can kind of play with it. Um, it'll give you all the information that you're going to want to need. But this is a great uh, website for everything. And of course, it's going to give you other eclipses that are visible too, including solar eclipses. Um, this is a good website for seeing just what eclipses are going to look like over the next 
several years. So really good website to work with. This is timeanddate.com. Just look up their Eclipse section, uh, but it'll give you all the information that you're going to want to know. Uh, there's the a better map showing how everything's going to look there, but really good resource right here uh, to know what your phases are going to be and what you're able to see during that eclipse. Um, of course, this is a super moon. We did talk about that in our uh, What's Up um, in the nighttime sky for May. We did talk this is a super moon, so it's going to be a bigger full moon, just a little bit bigger, but it's a super flower blood moon. Woo! Um, yeah, it's just going to be a little bit bigger, a little bit brighter, so yay. Um, but yeah, if you want to know everything about your location, time, when it's going to go through different phases, go to timeanddate.com. It's an excellent resource, um, for, for you to see. So I'm going to get rid of that real quick. Cause we're going to come back to that actually. Um, inside of that, you also want to know what type of eclipse it is. Is it a partial, also known as a penumbral eclipse where it just goes into the penumbra or a total, um, if it's a penumbral eclipse or a partial eclipse, we'll just go with that. If it's a partial eclipse, you kind of want to know how dramatic of an eclipse it's going to be. Is it just going to graze the outside edge of it and not really be noticeable? Because I've seen eclipses like that where you could probably tell if you took a time lapse, but it's not really, in my opinion, worth getting up and watching the event. Unlike a deeper partial eclipse where it actually looks like, you know, Cookie Monster took a bite out of it or a total eclipse, which is very dramatic with the red coloration and stuff, and that's what everybody thinks is cool. Now, uh, partial eclipses, they only pass through the, um, as we already talked about this, but a partial eclipse will only pass through the penumbra where a total passes through the umbra. And you'll just wanna check from your location what part you're gonna get. So certain areas are gonna show a total and certain areas might show a partial depending on where you're going to be now here's one of those maps again um this is from nasa with uh, um, help from several eclipse chasers uh fred espinek puts this together he's like mr eclipse he's like a master of eclipses and we're gonna i'm gonna show you his website here in a minute because he there's a lot of information I was going to put in here, but his website does such a nice job that we should really just show you the source. And if you want to go there and find out, you can go there and, and check it out yourself because he does a great job at doing all of that and documenting eclipses. So this is another, this is more of the, the chart you'll find on like a NASA website. Um, everything in dark uh, gray, you're not going to see it, obviously. Uh, the P1 or P4, um, that's when it's in the penumbra. Um, and then U means umbra. So it's just different stages. So usually P1 is when it's coming into the penumbra. U1 is when it's coming into the umbra. Um, the first edge of the moon is hitting it. Um, U2, um, not to be mixed up with the band. U2 generally means the moon is now within the umbra and the last edge of the moon has entered. Um, U3, um, between U2 and U3 is when totality basically is occurring. So um, U3 is when the moon is coming back out. Uh, the first edge of the moon has hit the other side of the umbra and U4 is when the last edge of the moon um, is leaving the umbra and then of course you have p4 which basically is going into the penumbra at that point so that's what all that actually means and then you can see right here the different shadings actually tell you how it's going to be visible so for this particular eclipse um, if you're on the east coast of the united states and of course in uh, south america um, you'll probably get you'll see part of the eclipse as the moon is setting you probably won't get much when you move over into more of central and some of the southern, eastern, southeast uh, coast of the United States, you're going to see it go, in, it'll be setting when it's going into the umbral stage, getting to that red tone, which might be kind of cool, and then so on and so forth. Um, 
as you go move through the different areas eventually getting to the all white part of the map which means you'll actually see the entire thing so it's that same kind of chart that we saw earlier on time and date it's just i like using this one a little bit more because it's it's a little bit easier and more laid out but they're both pretty much the same thing it's documenting the same thing so it's just a matter of which one you want to use this just happens to be the nasa uh, version of it and i'm gonna see if i can bring that up we're done with time and date um here we go um so this is the nasa so it's eclipse.gsfc.nasa.gov um you can always just type in nasa eclipse on google and it should pop up this is the eclipse that i'm sorry this is the website that covers everything about eclipses so solar lunar whatever you want this is the website that covers that so if you want to know about eclipses you need to come here um, for documentation um, this covers everything out into the foreseeable future and you can see it actually breaks it up uh, by type you have lunar eclipses you have uh, solar eclipses um, it's all broken up in here and you can actually find the pages so for lunar eclipses, you know, we can go by decade. Um, right now it's 2021 to 2030. We'll click on that. And here's a list of all the upcoming um, lunar eclipses uh, that are visible across the world. And it will tell you where everything is visible. So um, on May 26th, of course, we're going to have that partial eclipse. And here's actually how I was mentioning the different phases. Um, this chart that I pulled up, um, that's on the slideshow actually came from this document but you can actually see here how the path is going to work and you can see where p1 u1 and all that fun stuff um, is actually occurring it shows you so this one that's happening on may 26th in the northern hemisphere or not it's not just happening in the northern hemisphere but it will be visible next week um it's a total eclipse but it just kind of slides through the upper part of the umbra there it's not going right through the middle so it just barely becomes a total eclipse um, for a short amount of time. But uh, this is all information that you can get off of that website. You can actually print this out just like an eight and a half by 11 document. And it's got the chart there. And everything you wanna know is pretty much gonna be on here. So it works out really well. But you could use this website for any eclipse. So it looks like we have another one. It's going to be a partial. It's visible here in North America and Northern Europe, Eastern Asia, Australia, and the Pacific. Um, we have another one. It's a partial. This takes place on November 19th. And we'll take a look at that one as well. Um, this one, it does go through. It will get dark. And it looks like most of the United... I haven't looked at this one. Most of the United States is going to get this... Um, I'll have to look at the actual times that are not in UTC time. Um, I can't do the math on my head like that. But this one looks like it could be interesting too. This is the first time I'm actually taking a look at that. But for most of us here in the US um, and Canada as well, um, we're going to get a decent view of this. It's, it's not a total, but it's a very deep partial eclipse it looks like um, will be here. So that's the one on November 19th. 2021 uh, looks like it will also be interesting at least here in uh, North America you can see we'll get most of that Mexico gets a good view of it um, South America is going to get some um, during moon set and it looks like a lot of Asia and Australia and the Pacific are going to get at least um, some of it during moon set um, as well depending on where you're at you'll get all of it so but that's what's cool about this website. It's going to give you all kinds of details, you know, for the next decade. Um, so you can plan accordingly with these eclipse events. And this website's extremely helpful. You could do all kinds of stuff with it. So it's already linked on there. It's very well documented. So, you know, go on here, play around with it. Um, I find just Googling eclipses NASA is the best way to find this. Or you can just, um, here's the website right up here. Go ahead and check it out it's it, like i said showing you guys this is how i actually look up stuff so um we'll uh get out of this real quick and get back to our presentation because we are going to go back and talk about how to photograph the eclipse um going with uh, fred espinek um right here uh mr eclipse is his name 
We should get him on the webcast at some point. That might be a cool speaker. Um, he does such a nice job at it. So, you know, anything I could do does, doesn't hold a candle to his documentation already. So I'd rather just show you his website and have you go there if you want to know more about it. So, but this is how you actually see if it's going to be in your area. So that's, those are the ways I look up, uh, if an eclipse is going to be visible where I live or where I'm going to be. So hopefully that's helpful for you. And it applies also with solar eclipses. We'll probably do something on solar eclipses next year. Um, we have two eclipses that will be coming up in the next couple of years. We have one in 2023, which is a partial eclipse of the sun, and 2024, which is a total eclipse. Both of them are visible here in North America. We'll probably do something next year on how to prepare for that. Um, those are completely different uh, ways of approaching that because you have to be safe with filters. Where lunar eclipses are safe to view no matter what, and we're going to talk about that in the next section here, which leads us to how do I see it? Um, and that's a big question. So now we know we're able to see it. We know when our eclipse is going to happen. We know what's going to be visible from our given location. But now how do we actually observe it? And that's our, our next topic there because a lot of people want to go out and see it. So that's always a big question. So when it comes to lunar eclipses, this happens during the full moon. You don't need any special equipment. You know, there's no filters. Like when you're observing the sun, you need filters. But a lunar eclipse is not going to need it. You can just step out with your naked eye and look at it and just admire how cool that is. Um, but you can use any type of optical equipment that you want. You could use your naked eyes, like I just said. Um, you could use binoculars. You could use a small telescope, a camera lens. Um, there's all different ways that you can approach observing or photographing this particular event. Um, the only thing you really are gonna need to keep in mind with this is you just, especially if you're gonna be using a telescope, is you want something that's going to fit the entire full moon within the field of view. Now, if you've got one of these big telescopes with like a long focal length, let's say like a 14-inch Schmidt-Cassegrain, it can be difficult to get the entire moon in the field of view. And if you do get it, even at low power, it's going to be tight. It'll take up the whole field, which might be cool, but I actually find that having a more relaxed view is going to be better. Um, for me personally, I like using my six inch refractor. I think it's really versatile. It's easy to use. So refractors are generally my recommendation or a Newtonian or pretty much any telescope you want, but refractors are really easy to work with. Um, especially if you're going to do photography of it, particularly an APO refractor, but anything will work. It doesn't really matter. Just get the whole moon in the field of view. So the majority of telescopes are going to work. Um, I like using wide field optics. I like getting some space around it. Um, so that's what I would recommend going with is a wider field uh, telescope, something that gives you some space around the moon, um, not just zooming in because we're watching the moon as a whole. We're not just watching a part of it, but it all depends on just what you want to get out of it. Um, so any particular optic is going to work. Um, even your eyes that's going to work just fine. So it's really fair game on how you want to see or observe the eclipse and how much time you want to spend in it. If you just want to wake up, this particular one is really early in the morning. Um, it's like 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. where I'm at. So it's, it's not in an optimal time. So you probably want to have your equipment set up if you can um, or just walk out and enjoy it and take a look at it and go back inside. It all just depends on how much effort you actually want to put into observing this event. Now, the next thing, of course, that comes after that is photographing an eclipse. How do I take those crazy pictures? Um, how do I get something nice and cool like this? Um, most of the time in astronomy, I would definitely recommend using a monochrome camera for galaxies and deep sky and stuff like that. It's just that's the best camera and the best sensitivity um, for doing that. However, with a lunar eclipse, 
a color camera is the only way to go because you want to get that color and things are changing quickly so you want to make sure you're ready to go with that so the best way to do it i think the most convenient way is a dslr or a mirrorless camera it doesn't even have to be modified just a basic off-the-shelf camera is perfect uh, you can use color astronomy cameras like a planetary camera um, you just want something that's going to have a faster shutter speed to capture when the moon is fairly bright um, you're you're going to be like under a second easily like one two thousandth of a second is probably what you're going to be shooting so it's important that your camera is able to go that low and some of the astronomical cameras that are made for deep sky work don't have the ability to go that fast so make sure your camera can do that um, you will need to get to some longer exposure stuff when we're in totality we're talking a minute a couple seconds depending on how dark in your settings um, so you need to have a camera that's going to be able to do a few second exposures on the long side to something fast like one two thousand to one four thousand that just depends on how how you want to do it um, but a color camera is ideal it doesn't have to be modified just a basic camera is perfect um, i'm going to be shooting the upcoming eclipse which is my canon camera and it's going to be fine so it should be great at that point but you are going to need to remember darker as the moon does get darker you're going to need to take some longer exposures and with that you're also going to want a tracking mount um now longer focal length lenses i would also recommend unless you want to do some kind of artsy time lapse thing or you know like a mosaic of you know the moon and everything where it's all stitched together something cool you can use a wide field lens for that but if you just want to focus on the moon i would probably recommend somewhere about a three to more i would actually recommend 400 millimeter minimum um, and go up from there and this will actually depend on your camera sensor and if you're using a dslr or mirrorless camera you know all that's going to be you know really reliant on that so it doesn't really matter the sensor size but 400 millimeter would be minimum uh, you can go longer than that though and like i said earlier you are going to need a tracking mount um, most of the time the moon is very bright you can take a picture without much effort um, but when we start to get into those dark phases when the moon dips into the umbra and the totality section of an eclipse we're talking long exposures only a couple seconds so a basic uh, tracker like a sky tracker or a star adventurer would work just fine um, of course if you need something bigger because you're using a bigger optic then you know plan accordingly and use a larger mount so just you'll just have to work through that uh, depending on your setup you know personally for me i'll be shooting this eclipse with a six inch refractor so i'm going to need a bigger mount um just you know it's just a it's no different than going out and observing the moon with a telescope it just happens to be an eclipse so if you've got a telescope you know gives you a good view of the moon you're all set it doesn't really matter what the f ratio is you can always accommodate with uh exposure times and settings on the camera now just to give an example here is a 400 millimeter lens um, the red box is on a crop sensor or an APS-C size sensor so that is you know most of your average cameras out there um, from Canon Nikon Sony Fuji whatever um, will have a crop sensor on it it's very common camera uh, size as far as the sensor goes this is would be attached to a 400 millimeter lens and you can see how much space you have there so you actually have quite a bit of room to zoom in on there and i actually just want to play with this really quick i like using this website a lot this is called astronomy.tools um, and it's it's great for calculating your field of view so you want to go to imaging mode and we we're going to do the moon because we're doing an eclipse and they have a large selection of cameras already listed in here and all this is free so you can just pick your camera whatever you want um, so let's just say we're going to use a crop sensor camera that's a really common 
uh, sensor size. Well, you know, let's do like a Canon Rebel. Very popular camera. It's like a 750D, I think is what, whatever. The models, the sensor size is all the same. So this is a crop sensor camera. And let's put it on our 400 millimeter lens here. Don't worry about the aperture or pixel size or anything. We just want to figure out the field of view. So that's a 400 millimeter lens on a crop sensor. That's not too bad. You do have a lot of room to zoom in on it. So maybe you want to go even more um, with that. So let's say you have like a teleconverter um, for your 400 millimeter lens, like a 1.4 teleconverter. That's, that's pretty popular um, there. And let me just make sure I'm doing this right and don't have something weird going on. It's 400, so that gives us 560 millimeter. If we're going to use a 400 millimeter with a 1.4 teleconverter, that's 560 millimeters on our crop sensor. Let's add that. That actually tightens it up a little bit more, but you still have, you don't want to zoom in to where it's tight and you don't have extra space because if there's any drift on your mount, you want to have some leeway, and I think it looks cool to have some of the stars coming through in your image uh, during totality. So it's kind of neat. Um, so a crop sensor with like a 560 millimeter, or that would be a 400 millimeter with a 1.4 teleconverter. So if you're a photographer, a lot of people have that combo. Let's step up to like a telescope, though. Let's say it's like 600 millimeters. We're talking like our Evo Star 80. That's 600 millimeters. Um, it's not going to be much different, but you can see that it's getting a little bit better. Um, so that's something to think about. I'm going to start getting rid of some of this stuff. So this is our telescope now. We're at 600 millimeters um, with our crop sensor camera, like a Canon Rebel 600 millimeter uh, telescope focal length. Now, let's say you've got a a bigger telescope let's say it's a thousand millimeters um, add that to the field now it's getting you're starting to get framed up a little bit more so I like to use a thousand millimeter focal length that just happens to be what my refractor is at um, but you can see a crop sensor like a Canon Rebel or the Fuji series of cameras a lot of Nikon cameras the Sony Alphas like the a6000 series um, all crop sensors those frame up really nicely with a thousand millimeter focal length so if you've got a telescope with a thousand millimeter ish you're you're gonna frame that up nicely um let's just kind of look at this really um how much could we go so two thousand millimeters is too much um so if you have like a an eight inch schmidt casa grain and you're using a crop sensor um it's going to be too much you probably have to use your focal reducer to widen the field because you see we're going to start cutting off the moon there and that's something we don't want so let's get rid of that um let's do 1500 millimeters so 1500 millimeters with a crop sensor camera is going to probably be the tightest field i would recommend um shooting the moon it's just going to be tight and even then i think it's too much i would try to get a little bit wider if you can get something that's like a thousand millimeters to, we'll say 800 to 1200 millimeters is probably ideal for shooting the lunar eclipse to give you a nice resolution it fills the frame nice but you still got some space running around that would be my recommendation about 800 millimeters to 1200 millimeters would be nice and healthy for a crop sensor camera now let's switch things up and let's reset back to 400 millimeters but now we're going to do the full frame cameras you know we're talking the Sony Alpha series, the A7s, the A9, the A1s. Um, I don't know Nikon's equivalent full frames at the moment. Um, you know, for Canon, we're talking the EOS R series, you know, the R, RA, R5, R6, um, or the 5D Mark IVs, or the 1Ds, you know, anything that's full frame this is what we're going to be looking at. So let's do that. So you can see at 400 millimeters at full frame, the moon's going to be tiny. You can still get some cool stuff. You might be able to frame some stuff in the field of view as the moon is setting to get a cool shot with some foreground. That's something you can mess with. So 400 millimeters minimum would be my recommendation, regardless of crop sensor or full frame. I think 400, if you've got a lens that can go to 400 or more, 
you're good to go. You could do 300. It's just getting smaller. So I really think 400 when you're shooting the moon is the best start. Now let's go to 600 again. Now 600, you can see it's going to frame up a little bit better, um, but it's still going to be kind of big. It just depends on the look you're going for. And of course you could crop if you want. Now let's go up to a thousand. Um, a thousand millimeters is starting to get interesting. You've got some room around there. The moon's going to be bigger. If you just want to focus on the moon, again, that thousand millimeter focal length is kind of sweet, but that's something that you could uh, theoretically go up to. Uh, let's step up a little bit more to 1500. 1500 is probably the max I would recommend on a full frame camera. You've got the space around it. Uh, the moon's going to look great. It's going to take up like a third of the of the frame um maybe a little bit more than that but it's nicely framed in the telescope at 1500 millimeters so that would be my recommendation as the max focal length i would use for shooting a lunar eclipse with a full frame camera would be 1500 uh let's just for giggles um do 2000 2000 millimeters if you're using like an eight inch schmidt is doable I would say you could even squeak up to 2,000 mil 2, millimeters for full frame. That would probably be my max recommendation for a full frame camera. Shooting a lunar eclipse would be 2,000 millimeters. You're still going to get a nice frame. It's going to take like almost two thirds of the frame. Um, really high resolution shots. Um, so that would be something right there. 2,000 millimeters would be my personal recommendation as the max focal length for a full frame camera to shoot a lunar eclipse with. So if you want to mess with that, this is Astronomy Tools. Um, it's just a website you can go check out. Um, yeah, just astronomy.tools. And they've got all kinds of cool stuff in there. It's just a free uh, website that you can go use. And you can do that with eyepieces and imaging and binoculars. So they've done a really nice job with it. So go ahead and check uh, that stuff out right there. But hopefully that was helpful as far as field of view. Uh, calculators as far as focal length. So for crop sensors, maximum focal length I would recommend is about 1500. And for full frame, 2000. Now... Uh, we are getting close to the end of the webcast and normally with the end of the what's up webcast I would say we open it up to a Q&A session um, because this is pre-recorded and I'm not here to answer your questions if you have any questions you can always email us at support at skywatcherusa.com title it what's up and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have um, regarding this topic or any other topic so just a heads up now finally camera settings camera settings are going to vary greatly it depends on the sensitivity of your camera like the, the iso the what iso are you going to shoot with the aperture of your lens what's the opening of your lens and focal length we've already talked about uh, you know we just finished that so if you need to go back you can go back and watch that part of the section now i was going to do this big old thing in the camera settings um, but I didn't think it was really worth it because um, if you go to Fred Espinex um, website it's called mr eclipse.com Fred is a master of eclipses he's been to tons and tons of eclipses all around the world um, I have not had the pleasure of meeting him um, I've seen him at the 2017 solar eclipse and some other astronomy events, but I've never had the pleasure of actually talking um, with him. But Fred does, he's just great at eclipses. And solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, he's done it all. Um, you can go to his website here, again, mrecliptes.com. It's going to have everything you're ever going to want to know about how to do eclipses. Um, so I could sit here and regurgitate everything that's on their what his website, but this is really the website. If you want to know how to observe something, this is the website to go to. Now we're talking lunar eclipses. Now, if you want to know for beginners, he's got a whole section right here about how everything works and the types of eclipses. Um, I guess there are three types of uh, eclipses. There's two broad types, you know, partial and total, which we talked about earlier. Um, but technically I guess there could be three, but he documents all of that really well. 
He tells you why it's red. Um, tons of stuff. So excellent, excellent resource to have is mysteryclips.com. Now, what about camera settings? And when I was going to do the 2017 solar eclipse, it was my first time. I've never done a total, total solar eclipse. Um, I went to Fred's website, and he's got a really cool thing here. And this is for lunar eclipses, but he has the same thing for solar, where he breaks everything down um, that you're going to ever want to know. So here's a cool wide-angle shot of a lunar eclipse in Gemini something to consider you could do a wide field shot something cool talks about all of that there's you know star trail options there's all kinds of cool stuff and he's he actually breaks this down by focal length um really really cool stuff uh here and it's just but the big thing here is the lunar eclipse exposure guide this chart pretty much is going to tell you everything that you're going to want to know about shooting a lunar eclipse i could tell you in here what to do but it's so much easier to just see this chart that fred has put together and how to do it so of course you have your iso settings right here if you don't know what iso is you really should know if you're going to be using a digital dslr or mirrorless camera i would hope you know what iso is and if you don't um Please take the time to learn what that is. That's going to be your sensor's sensitivity um, on how sensitive the sensor is going to be. The bigger the number, the more sensitive, roughly. And then, of course, you need to know what your aperture of the lens is, which is listed as the f-stop. And all of this is going to vary what exposure time you are going to need for capturing different times. So you have the full moon. The penumbral phases, the partial phases, dependent on magnitude, and then of course the total eclipse um, in there. And knowing this will give you an idea so you're not wasting time during totality. And the nice thing about a total eclipse of the moon is it's not a super quick event, um, unlike totality in a solar eclipse where you have minutes to get your shots. Um, the moon is way more forgiving and you have way more time to adjust accordingly. But this is a great resource right here to show you what you could need for each phase. So, you know, let's just look at this real quick. So let's say we're shooting at ISO 800. The nice thing about shooting at a low ISO is you're not going to get noise and grain in your image. It's going to be pretty clean, but it's not super sensitive. Now you're also going to want to know like your f-stop. Now you're shooting the moon, which is bright in general. So generally you're gonna to wanna to stop that lens down. It doesn't have to be this big, fast F1.4 lens. It doesn't need to be that. And in fact, the stars in the field on the outer edge aren't gonna look good if you're doing that. So probably somewhere around F4 or lower is probably what you're gonna need. So let's say you know, you're shooting at ISO 800. You've got your 400 millimeter lens on there. Uh, you're probably going to want to start at f8 as the aperture, and then you just follow the grid down. During the full moon at f8, you're looking at one four thousandth of a second. Uh, the partial eclipse, you're looking at one two thousandth of a second. And then, of course, as it goes through the partial phases, as it gets darker, there's the different uh, exposure times that you're going to need. But now you see when we get into totality, um, when it's in the umbra or the dark uh, shade of, I'm sorry, the dark shadow of earth, you're going to start doing half a second, um, two seconds, eight seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, depending on whatever your settings are. Um, and of course, you can adjust accordingly and mess around with it too, if you want to experiment with it. But this is a really good uh, chart detailing all of that. So this is on mrecliptz.com. Um, I do recommend going there. He's got a lot of ideas, multiple exposures, telephoto. See, here's all the field of view stuff here. Actually, look, it, his stuff actually lined up what I was saying. I didn't even know this was here. Um, you can see 200, 400, 500, 1,015. So, yeah, that's it looks pretty good right there. So, um, but just spend some time on here. It's got all kinds of information. You've got plenty of time if you want to shoot the upcoming eclipse, but 
um, all kinds of information here uh, to learn about uh, capturing a lunar eclipse. And again, that is mr.eclipse.com. Um, go check it out. Uh, great resource. This is what I've used for many eclipses, and it'll tell you everything that you're going to want to know um, for capturing any type of eclipse. So hopefully uh, that was helpful for you guys. Well, that's pretty much it for the the episode here. I really hope you guys actually enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. Um, now, if you... Oh, I should probably do this real quick. I, I absolutely meant to show you guys this. I'm going to try to get my uh, browser back up here real quick. Um, uh, let me get this over here so I can actually find the link. Um, if you're not sure what you want to do for the lunar eclipse, or maybe you can't um, see it, you know, maybe the weather didn't work out for your area, um, but you still want to be a part of it, um, I will be doing a live uh, uh, webcast of it uh, through my outreach program called Focus Astronomy. Um, if you want to be a part of that, um, it is already up on the Focus Astronomy YouTube channel right there. Um, we'll be doing the total uh, lunar eclipse live stream, 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Pacific. It's going to be a long day. Um, but you can go ahead and join me uh, during those hours. Um, if you want to be a part of the live stream there, um, come on, come along and join me um, early in the early in the morning and check it out. So um, that's up there and available for anybody who would like to be a part of that. So, um, but if not, good luck to trying to observe it. Um, I really look forward to seeing some of your pictures. Um, again, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Next week, the last Friday of May for 2021, we are going to have uh, Dr. Jeff Hall. He's the director of Lowell Observatory. He's going to be here live uh, from Flagstaff, Arizona with us. And we're going to sit down and have a chat and learn about Lowell Observatory and its history. Um, so that should be a really cool episode. So definitely join us uh, next Friday for Dr. Jeff Hall of Lowell Observatory. The link is already up, so you should be have access to that already. But it should be an awesome episode and a great way to wrap up the month of May. So thank you very much, everyone. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Title it, What's Up? Uh, if you have any questions about the eclipse, uh, same thing, just email us there. If you like what you see here, go ahead and subscribe. And we look forward to seeing you guys at the next episode. So thank you very much. Have a safe weekend, clear skies, and take care, everyone. Have a great weekend.